Hey, I'm Winston, and I like to see and see things. Today we're going to make a really simple branding iron. Hello guys, Winston here. After meandering my way across Ohio, I found myself in Kentucky, home of many fine beverages, a basketball team I'm obligated to hate, and also Bob Claggett. He invited me over and gave me free reign over a corner of his shop to make stuff in. Now, I had been planning projects to do on the road for the past two months, and I knew that Bob didn't have a branding iron. So back in what was formerly the Machine Shop of Horrors, I prepared some brass blanks to use for this project. These were made from 3 8 inch stock that I cut into 1.5 by 1.8 inch rectangles. Because of the thickness of the material, I really didn't want to be slotting through it with a normal end mill. Slotting cuts tend to be noisy and chattery because the end mill is rubbing both the inside and outside walls of the cut. And if you can't get chips out of the cut fast enough, you can get chip recutting or clogged flutes, which would probably be showstoppers on lower powered machines like the Nomad. Instead, I cut out my blanks using adaptive clearing. I basically sketched up a containment boundary around my part with two contours and told Fusion to adaptive in that region only. This wastes a little more material, but it's super reliable and stress-free because you have a little extra room for chip evacuation and controlled cutting forces. My work holding for this setup was with double-sided tape and some physical stops to help soak up any lateral loads. Nothing fancy. Once that was done, I took the blanks off my Nomad and used my hand tapping machine to cut threads in the 0.2 inch hole that I had also milled in the part. You need to use a bottoming tap here in order to cut the threads all the way down since it's not a through hole. I used a little fine grit sandpaper to clean up the back faces of the blanks and then these were ready for the road trip. At Bob's house, I brought in the SVG of his logo and extruded it outward on the front face of the model of my branding iron head. Since it's symmetrical, I didn't have to reverse it. I modeled the logo to be proud of the background by about 0.05 inches. That standoff distance is important because as the logo presses into the wood, you don't want the material in the background to scorch the wood as well. This is more of a concern in pine or softer woods. Now on the cam side, I only use normal flat bottomed end mills. If you order a branding iron from someone who does this more often, you'll likely get a branding iron that was also machined with a tapered end mill or a V-bit. This lets you cut sharp corners and gives thin features a wider base so that they're stronger. But for the features in Bob's logo, it was just easier to accept a small radii in the internal corners of his logo. A 1 32nd inch end mill would leave an almost imperceptible radius. If you want to see how I would use Fusion 360 in a V-bit to really get into tiny corners, I'll have a link to a previous branding iron project I did where I had to machine around text. I started my cam by using a 3D adaptive clear with an 8th inch end mill. This would remove the bulk of the brass as quickly as possible. Now, I haven't done a lot of experimentation to determine the best feeds and speeds for brass on the Nomad, but here I was using 10,000 RPM, a feed rate of 12 inches per minute, an optimal load of 20 thou, and a step down of 25 thou. I left 5 thou stock to leave. Next up was a 1 16th inch end mill using adaptive clearing with rest machining to focus my cutting only on the parts that hadn't been cut out yet. Again, I'm using 10,000 RPM, 12 inches per minute, but my optimal load here is 10 thou and my step down is 20 thou. These were values I sort of just guesstimated. There's definitely room to push your CNC harder if you're willing to accept more risk of breaking a tool. And finally, I would run a 1 32nd inch end mill through an adaptive clear with rest machining, 10,000 RPM and 10 inches per minute because I wanted a slightly smaller chip load. 10 thou optimal load and 18 thou step down. I still had 5 thou stock to leave set because I wanted to come back with a 2D contour up to clean up all the walls last, but before I did that, I would come in and bore out the holes in Bob's logo. I'm doing a helical ramp all the way to full depth with a follow-on finish pass. I know that the wall finish inside those holes doesn't matter, but it matters to me. With my toolpaths posted, I began setting up my stock. To hold the branding iron blank securely, I'm using the Carbide 3D Low Profile Vise, plus some half-inch poor man's parallels to elevate my part. JPL Richard hates this idea because he thinks parallels need to be precision ground, and I kind of agree with him, but plus or minus a thou is good enough for me. I'm also setting up a stop block, or rather a stop clamp, on the side in case I screw up and need to swap in a new blank. As I tightened my vise, I also gave my stock a good whack with a soft tool in order to ensure that it was properly seated on the parallels. These vise faces have a tendency to pinch at the bottom, and if you exaggerate that movement you can see that it would squirt the part out the top, so ensuring your stock is bottomed out is always good practice. In a real CNC, you would use a dead blow mallet for this, but please don't do that on the Nomad. <laughs> 
I loaded up an eighth inch zirconium nitride coated end mill and zeroed off against the stock. I wiggled a piece of paper underneath the end mill to get myself within 0.1 millimeters of z-axis zero, then I stepped down in 0.01 millimeter increments, turning the spindle by hand, until I felt the end mill scraping. This is about as accurate as you can get when setting your zero height. In order to determine my x and y zero, I used a center finder. I touched off on one side, zeroed my offset, touched off on the other side, and set my offset to half the distance traveled. The math really doesn't get any easier than this. And then it was time to hit run on the first program. The eighth inch end mill here is a little loud because of its length. Stub flute end mills would be more rigid and vibrate less, but all I have is general purpose length end mills. Still, I was pretty happy with the surface finish on the floor. Next, I swapped in a 1 16th inch coated end mill and let that do its thing. It was much quieter, though still a little shrill on material entry. And lastly, the tiny 1 32nd inch end mill came into play. This one I didn't have with the zirconium nitride coating, so I just used a plain uncoated version. This operation was quiet enough to hold a conversation over. Very fortunately, all of these toolpaths ran without a hitch on the first try. I consider myself pretty darn lucky for that. Shortly before dinner, I pulled out a completed branding iron head. Now of course, I couldn't leave without seeing it in action, so Bob threw together a really quick handle. This iron threads onto anything that's quarter 20, but Bob couldn't find any threaded rod, so he settled on a long bolt to attach this to. He cut the head of the bolt off and turned a really quick handle out of some walnut scraps. On the drill press, he drilled out a 13 64th inch hole and tried to run a wood tap through it. I voiced my concerns about this step, but Bob thought he could just run the tap straight through on the drill press. If he were using a tap holder with a clutch that would reverse the rotation of the tap at a set height, it might have worked, but instead the threads were destroyed as soon as the tap bottomed out. Done it before. It is. Luckily, we had some extra length in the handle, so we chopped off the last two inches or so and redrilled the hole. This time, he tapped the handle with a cordless drill so that we could back out the tap in a controlled manner. To heat up the iron as efficiently as possible, we use a map gas torch. You'll notice a subtle color transition as the brass gets up to temperature. Then, it's just a matter of applying steady pressure to the iron without moving it from the initial contact point. The results were great, though ideally you'd have a couple more inches of standoff distance between the iron head and the handle. This was just a quick prototype that we knocked out in an evening. It ended up working just fine for the short duration that we were playing around with it. And this is the basic version of how you can make your own branding iron on a desktop CNC machine. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and thank Bob for being such a gracious host. I'll be back with more CNC projects for my cross-country road trip soon. It'll work. It'll work. I'm sure it'll work, it's just it looks a little ridiculous. <laughs> of course it does.